My name is Jonathan Keller. I'm a student here in Master of Public Administration in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And I have with me Professor Eugene Kandel, the Economic Advisor for the Bureau of the Prime Minister, the Israeli Prime Minister. Professor Kandel, thank you for being here. It's a great honor. A great honor for me to be here. Let me ask you a first question. You have been, in the last six years, the Economic Advisor for the Israeli government. And you have observed from inside the interactions between political decision makers and economic experts. Is there such a, such a thing today as economic leadership? What are the qualities that, in your view, are required to economic leaders? Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to correct you a bit because I was the economic advisor of the prime minister. It's so only through him I, I was on periphery a bit uh, advising because in Israel by law the govern, uh, governor of the Bank of Israel is the economic advisor to the to the uh, to the government but actually it's a very timely question because it's more and easier and easier becomes with the in in the age of this connectivity and everybody is uh, you know expressing opinions and the Facebook and the, all these uh, signups, it's become very, very easy to organize all kinds of initiatives from, from bottom up. And economic leadership uh, consists of two things. First of all, you, uh, as a politician, you understand that you will never be uh, sufficiently conversant in details and in, in, in depth in the, in the problems that you, that you face. So you have to have advisors, good advisors, whom you trust. That's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is that you have to have a political will to stand up and do what you think is needed and not what is written on the last Facebook of somebody who is writing uh, or what's popular. This is something that is increasing, we're increasingly seeing that people uh, are, uh, many politicians are drawn uh, into what's popular rather than what's right. And uh, this, is, this is a problem because, uh, you know, that's the difference between being led and being in lead. So, you know, in Israel we had this example of, uh, to, to perhaps very, very extreme, that uh, after we brought uh, to the Prime Minister, you know, the number of uh, senior regulators and, and uh, advisors brought to the Prime Minister and Minister of Energy a proposal on how to regulate and to, to, to make sure that we, we uh, utilize our gas fines. Uh, it was very, very unpopular. It was very controversial because the Facebook and some media and some other politicians were screaming their heads off that this is... Uh, that we should we should be uh, doing things that we felt would harm the state of Israel and the and the public, and so the prime minister chose what's right rather than what's popular, and so I consider that economic leadership for two for two reasons. A, he has a very clear vision of what he sees as economic development and economic strategy, and B, he trusts he appoints advisors and he trusts them, and so that is that is something that I can only admire. Thank you. A few months ago, you have presented an economic plan that has been widely criticized for not targeting the reduction of poverty and inequality. But my question is more general. Do you think that economic planners should deal with socio-economic benchmarks? Should they deal with sustainable development? Let me answer it in two, in two ways. First of all, we, we presented strategic outlook for 15 years. In that strategic outlook, um, there was many different things that referred to various aspects of um, multifaceted economic development and social development. There was one minister who's, uh, who felt that he was not sufficiently represented in bodies that were found. And so he created this sort of a storm in a cup of uh, tea. Uh, around it, uh, this was completely not, this was lack of economic leadership, this was, you know, making noise. Um, not only that, is that my office, together with the, with the two other, with the Ministry of uh, Environment and, the, and the, Prime Minister, uh, Pro, the Director General of Prime Minister Office, we led one of the initiatives that created well-being indicators and incorporated into the, into the policy 
72 indicators in nine categories and presented into the government approved it and actually OECD is hailing us as one of the leaders in the world in in incorporating much broader view including housing and safety and other things into the the policy uh, guidelines and, and evaluation of how the government is doing uh, so we we have nothing to um, you know so and, and we should be doing that because for very simple reason because the public does not uh, the, the, the quality of life of the public is not summarized to one number GDP growth GDP is a great number because it's positively correlated with a bunch of things but it also if tomorrow I'm going to destroy all the capital in the country and we start building new capital that will be great for GDP very bad for you know stock of capital for example so GDP, as many things in economics, measures certain things well, but other things not well. So we need to broaden that and actually so that it would correspond to the to the way to, to the features that actually matter to the public. It has additional benefit because if you measure this, the public actually knows how things are comparable to other countries and to themselves over time. Because we have we're living in the in the world in which the public has no idea how much improvement in the in the quality of life they actually experience. So that's a great way to actually make the public feel better for, for the good reason. Farid Zakaria has once noticed that a decade of violent conflicts have basically done no nothing to the success story of Israel's economy. Do you think that there is still today a linkage between national security and economic prosperity is stability still a necessary condition to growth well it's definitely not necessary you know Israel grew uh, over the last decade at 4.6 percent in real terms uh, including the crisis uh, so you know just by observation it's not it's not a necessary condition and it turns out even though we had quite a few skirmishes uh, over that period of time uh, I think that uh, it would be great to feel safe, completely safe. I mean, we feel pretty safe, but to be completely void of, of, of uh, any conflict, we would love to have peaceful relations with our neighbors. That would probably increase the quality of life, but I doubt that would dramatically increase the, the, the standard of living or growth. Because um, we could help our neighbors, but even if we have, when we have peace with countries like Jordan and, and, and Egypt, in many cases they don't really want or don't really trade with us. Even though we can provide them with uh, advancements in technology that would revolutionize the, the agriculture, the water, the, the healthcare, etc. So, in principle, it could be at some point. I don't see that happen in in um, the next uh, ten years, no matter what kind of advancement we can have. So I think the peace dividend, in economic terms, is 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 going to be is going to be uh, not very large. Uh, Rand Corporation recently did a study, which they publicized. and they looked at the peace dividend for the Palestinians and and, and Israelis. And it turns out that the peace dividend, in absolute terms, is much bigger for Israeli economy. But they, but the, some of the, some of the uh, assumptions that they make are are not. Uh, I don't think they're very plausible. But you know, basically, it's, you know, it could be somewhat bigger, somewhat smaller. But that's. But in percentage terms, relative to the economy, which is the growth, Israel gains few percentage points, whereas Palestinians gain 40, 50 percent almost immediately. So these are huge differences, uh, and the same and the same would be, of course, you know, in Syria. Syria, if they sort of get their act together and stop fighting, they will get enormous increase in in, in growth. I don't think that Israel will will have that. And uh, uh, at the same time, and and by the way, investors from around the world and clients of Israeli firms understand that. So the stock exchange barely makes a hiccup around sort of security, yeah. lar even large security events, and the growth doesn't doesn't budge. 
So I definitely not in necessary condition, but you know, it would be nice to be to 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 have it. Mm -hmm. It's not definitely not the economics that are driving us to seek peace. That's not. You are known for making a great deal to promote long-term economic strategies. And I suppose it hasn't been easy in a country that is famous for focusing on day-to-day -day crisis management. So what is the secret? How public servants like us may do to help decision makers to think on the long term? You know, the interesting thing, in, in 2010, we, uh, we asked the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance to appoint us the the Director General, Minister of Finance, myself, to try to bring a strategy to to the Israeli government. It was the first time that it was set out in such a way on this social economic side. On the military and the diplomatic side, we have a long-term strategy. And so we started thinking about strategy and we, 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 we went with Rand Corporation and other consultants to, to learn what was happening in the world. It turns out that it's extremely difficult. Practically nobody, except for Singapore, has been able to really articulate long-term strategy and actually per per persevere with it. For example, the uh, Tony Blair introduced strategy um, unit in the Prime Minister office, which survived as long as he was there, but then it was disbanded. And strategy requires, it's, it's difficult because democratic countries are anti-strategic by, by almost by definition. And Israel is not any, any uh, so, so, so Singapore is a big exception, okay, with these long-term views and, and very, very long-term uh, attitude of everybody from the ministers to to the uh, civil servants, to the public. And I think it starts with the public. It starts with the leadership, of course, but the public support, support to that leadership is, and Lee Kuan Yew, you know, in whose name the school is named, has created an, an, an unbelievable connectivity between the public and the, and, the, and the government in common trust and the common goals looking very very forward you know 20 30 40 years forward and and the results are, are are obvious you know singapore grew over the last 50 years five times faster than israel okay and singapore had its own problems with with neighbors it had problems with no resources no so everything but everybody else now because the election cycle is very very short and very few uh, uh people in electorate Think about what kind of things that you've done in your current term to prevent problems 10 years from now. You know, they want to see what you have done that affected their lives today. You know, if you're a politician, you respond to these incentives and you, and you do things that affect the lives today. And so it's almost, you have no incentive, actually negative incentive to spend your time and political capital on things that, yeah. that's why many countries are not able to get out of this you know, uh, sort of putting out fires uh, um, mentality, and so what we what what we met, so what we did is to shift from the content of strategy to the process. We completely we thought we we're going to prepare a strategy. We stopped preparing strategy. We prepared a process, and so we've introduced the process of institutions and and processes within the government that are mandated to have strategic interactions between the bureaucracy itself and then the bureaucracy and the civil servants and the, and the politicians. And the interesting thing is we thought that we would be met with, you know, dismissal or cynicism or, you know, because in Israel people say, well, let's do, there's a word, tachles, that means, you know, be to the point, what are you? And we came and we said, look, guys, let's think 15 years, 10, 15 years ahead. The interesting thing, it's much easier to agree on common common goals and directions 15 years rather than agreeing on to this year budget. Okay, and so we found to our surprise a huge thirst for common when you leave your bickering aside, you get into the room and start thinking about what kind of future you want for your country. It was so liberating. I mean, we were almost uh, on the verge of tears how emotional it was because people were saying, look, we were hoping to get somebody would do this, finally. So we just 
put it on on the table and and it just coagulated then we prepared it in the among civil servants and we brought it to the government so the government has to hear strategic outlook every year and every new government within 130 days of its establishment has to get this so i gave two of those in my tenure in 2013 2015. that was i thought at the beginning they gave me half an hour i said i can't do it in half an hour the first government at the end it was three hours two separate sessions three hours in front of the cabinet anybody who knows how busy the system is knows that this and most of the ministers were sitting there and were participating and were riveted to their chairs. They said, came to me, and a lot of ministers don't give you compliments, said, look, you've opened my thinking, you know, and so you put together several small number of big initiatives that say, look, if we don't do this, we'll sort of, this area will deteriorate because it's between many ministries, it's between, you know, it'll fall between chairs. And so we were actually very much positively surprised. I hope that it will continue, but you know, there you need drivers and the prime minister was a driver and, and, and I was a driver and there were some other drivers for this process. So we hope that, that this drive will continue because what we know is that without the leadership, apropos economic leadership that we started with, nothing will, 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 will happen because the system is actually working against it. So do you have any advice for an Israeli student like me studying public policy in Singapore? Well, first study well, because this is one of the best places to study public policy. It's, I think it's, uh, you know, it's my second time in Singapore. I came here two years ago, and at that time I was still in the government. I just left a few, few weeks ago. And at that time I had very, very extensive exposure to the government. And I was, I came out with so many, um, insights out of here that it was it was really eye-opener so first of all try to understand how this government works that's like a field study it's the i think it's the best place to 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 be if you really want to understand the public policy the other thing is that try to figure out what kind of features of that policy are singapore specific and which kind of features you can actually embed into more strategic thinking into into being very uh, how do you one of the biggest things that uh, i just gave an interview uh, to israeli newspaper last week uh, in which i said that we are um, we are engaging in public discourse that is ruining our trust in each other and the public's trust in the government and so that is not necessarily because we can criticize without generalizing and throwing the baby with the war and so singapore has established this trust and you have criticism you have uh, particular things that people don't like and they let their government know but they basically and i i've been asking uh, taxi drivers these are singaporeans of of you know that, that, I, that i get to to speak without sort of them knowing who i am and basically all of them said that they trust the government, that the government is doing good things for them. And it's, it's very, very, uh, very, very impressive. We need to understand how this is done and try to, to improve uh, back home. Professor Kandel, thank you very much for this interview and enjoy your trip in Singapore. Thank you. I enjoyed it.